a uh, thing that I have to answer a lot is, you know, when people ask me what you do for a living and uh, I say I, I own a lemonade business, it's kind of like a little bit of a, oh gosh, under their breath, poor dude. <laughs> <laughs> we are talking about lemonade here, but lemonade, when you do the numbers that we do, we're doing six figures in shows. Our record is over six figures in a day. And in order to pull that kind of money in, you need to have a super solid system. We stand today. The Business Method the business with method. the Shadow. The Business Method. The Business Method Podcast. The Business Method Podcast featuring Chris Reynolds. Entrepreneurs, systems, methods, tools, and tactics for location independence. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm your host, Chris Reynolds, and welcome to the Business Method Podcast, a podcast featuring successful entrepreneurs and high-profile people dissecting their online and location-independent business models. We dissect the different methods, tools, and tactics of high-performance online entrepreneurs and high-caliber people in a series format. On our first series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs in 100 days that had built businesses creating $100,000 or more annually. On our second series, we are interviewing 100 entrepreneurs that have built location-independent businesses that generate a million dollars or more in annual revenue. There's a growing movement of people building these caliber of businesses and we are getting behind the minds, the logic, and the science of what it takes to build businesses like this. On top of that, we also gather entrepreneurs at events and retreats around the world. This October, we are having our annual event in Thailand, Get Shit Done Live. It's 10 days of high performance productivity, targeted collaboration, and rapid execution designed for entrepreneurs to get a lot of work done in a little amount of time. Some say it's like 10 months of work in 10 days. There's a magic that happens when brilliant minds come together to push one another towards productive execution. That is exactly what this retreat is about. Check out all the details at thebusinessmethod.com. That is thebusinessmethod.com. Now, let's jump in today's show. The Business Method. Have you ever had a dream to start a business that would allow you to have six to eight months off per year so you can do whatever you want? I know I did and still do. Josh Lang is our guest today and he had that same dream. Josh started his first lemonade stand when he was only 22 years old. He was so motivated to work the summers and ski during the winters that he hustled at events around the country for four months, working as hard as he could to take the rest of the year off. Fast forward a few years and now he regularly makes over six figures at one event and has built this into a seven-figure business and still taking at least six months off per year. On the show today, Josh shares how he started out with just $100 in a dream. He dives into tons of his secrets, including the importance of persistence, creating impeccable systems to run a business, the difference between a five, six, and seven-figure mentality, and how to grow your mentality as an entrepreneur. Josh also trains entrepreneurs to grow their businesses and, of course, towards the the end of the show, we ask him how to make the best lemonade in the world. Just a heads up, you guys, for some reason, the microphone did not want to connect during Josh's interview, and we didn't find that out until afterwards. So the quality is a little bit worse than normal. Apologize, but it's still very clear and turned out to be a really good episode. Without further ado, this is a fun episode. Josh Lang. Entrepreneurs, systems, methods, tools, and tactics. Listeners, I'm really excited to welcome Josh Lang to the show, the founder of Just Squeeze Juice and Just Brewed Coffee. Josh, how are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Thanks for having me. And you're calling from the other side of the world, Victoria, British Columbia, is that right? Actually, I'm sitting in uh, in Whistler, British uh, Columbia. Yeah. yeah. We, yeah. Had, we had another guy on the show that lives in Whistler. His name is Nev Lapwood, and he's the founder of Snowboard Addiction. Dot com. Have you ever met him? I have not met him actually, but now I want to. Actually, yeah. So we did a podcast. It's the business method.com forward slash nev dash lapwood. And if you want to intro to him, I think you guys would probably hit it off with your lifestyles. But he was a Kiwi from New Zealand and moved just the Whistler to snowboard, started doing these cool snowboard videos on this platform that was really new back in the day called, and now it's YouTube. And now he's got this uh, multi-million dollar business selling snowboards, snowboard equipment, and doing still doing teaching people on YouTube how to snowboard. So you guys might be a, a, a good fans sure. of each other. You're you're a skier or a snowboarder too, right? Yeah, I'm a skier. Um, you know, kind of born skier uh, since the age of four, and then <clears throat> you know skied my entire life, and actually dabbled a bit with snowboarding too. I I had a little bit of a 
I used to compete actually in skiing and uh, and then in snowboarding. So, wow. but for the most part, I call myself a skier. Although I do throw on the snowboard once or twice a year. Still, <laughs> that's good. At least you cross over now and then, and you're not wholeheartedly just one or the other. You know, you got to mix it up, right? <laughs> It's good to have, you know, skills in life. And if you can throw on uh, a snowboard or, you know, I, I actually still find it just fascinating that you slide down a mountain on this, on, you know, frozen water. Yeah. <laughs> you know, going as fast as we can is actually, you know, it, it is under control as we, as we are too. Just, it's, it's, it's one of the most amazing things ever. It's probably like surfing. I don't know if you ever surfed, but yeah, for sure. I lived in Costa Rica for a year, so I got a lot of surfing. Yeah, exactly. And and you never know. It's good that you know both skills because you never know when you're going to be in the backwoods and you only have a snowboard or you only have skis and an avalanche happens and that's the only way to get out, right? So right. if you exactly. don't, if you've never snowboarded or you never skied, you know, there's your you're, you're gone. You're gone. <laughs> you're toast. Exactly. Exactly. But you're from Santa Fe, is that right? Yep. Yeah, exactly. I, I grew up in Santa Fe, New Mexico. That's where I actually started my business, just yeah. squeezed. And, uh, but I've moved around uh, quite a lot, um, <clears throat> lived in, in a, a huge variety of places. Um, so I've definitely been the type of person who is a bit nomadic and likes to, to adventure around, explore the world and, and, you know, take chances with, even with living in different places. So I've lived anywhere from the most random place I've lived for me, for people who know me is New York city, which <laughs> doesn't really mix with, uh, you know, who I am in my personal life, but I thought, you know, why not give it a try? And probably the, the, the most um, exotic place um, is Switzerland. So, which, you know, is more in line with the kind of guy that I am skiing and being in the mountains. Yeah. Do you, do you have a home base now or do you just kind of each every six months decide on a new place and stay there? Yeah. So in my older years now, not that I'm old, but, um, I've definitely settled a little bit. I still get around a lot. Um, but I, my home base when I'm not on the road working is actually in Vancouver, British Columbia now. So, okay. uh, that's where my girlfriend is from. She's actually from Victoria. So, uh, so that's where I call, you know, my home base, but my second home base where we base the business out of and where we pay taxes and where we store all of our equipment, which is pretty vast right now, is um, is in New Mexico. So that's our, our business. Gotcha. Base. That's and, also where my family is. And why do you choose Victoria, uh, BC, for, for your off season? Um, well, actually, Vancouver. But, Vancouver, um, sorry. Um, well, that's where my girlfriend is. Okay. And, um, yeah, we're, uh, we're, we're probably going to move to Squamish here pretty soon, which is a really killer spot. I don't know if you've ever been up here, but uh -uh. great spot for mountain biking and, uh, uh, outdoors, outdoor lifestyle. Very cool. Well, well, um, I, I love your business model. Cause as you know, we're featuring a hundred seven figure location, independent entrepreneurs, um, who have built these amazing business models. And usually we get people that are kind of in the tech scene or have these online businesses and they get to live remotely and run, you know, um, a software company or run, uh, sell things on Amazon and all these different things. But mm -hmm. your story is awesome because it's kind of like every kid's dream, you know, as they're 12 years old, selling lemonade on the golf course or in their little small towns. And they're thinking about make it, how they can make a million dollars. And you kind of just did it. And what's what I, how I relate to it is because I think we grew up probably before the internet boom happened. And I was in grad school and I actually had a goal to start selling things at uh, state fairs and big fairs all around the country. And I made a business plan out uh, one summer when I was in grad school. I figured out the financials, the numbers, the investments, all the stuff that I needed. But then, you know, as things happen, I just finished grad school and that kind of, I, I decided to take off to Florida and then to Phoenix and then uh, kept going and going and going. But that business plan just kind of went to the wayside, but you stuck to it, which is awesome. So I'm really excited to, to hear your story and how you panned out. It's been 21 years since you started the business. Is that right? Yeah, unbelievably. It's our 21st season here. So nice. started in 1998. Um, and it's, How old were you then? So I was 22. 
Cool. Very cool. Yeah. 22 ripe and not experienced and at all in the world of business. And where, um, where, where'd the idea come from? Like, where, did you have lemonade stands as a kid? <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, that's kind of an interesting, you know, uh, thing that I have to answer a lot is, you know, when people ask me what you do for a living and uh, I say I, I own a lemonade business, it's kind of like, you know, a little bit of a like, oh, gosh, under their breath, poor dude. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's OK. Like, I'm super confident in what I do and how we do it. We do everything extremely well. Um, and so, yeah, when I was, you know, the idea, I actually say more often nowadays than than, uh, you know, is it's probably the most unoriginal idea there is like, you know, starting a lemonade stand. So basically what I did was I came back from actually right here. I was, I was training. Uh, that was when I made the transition over to being a snowboarder and I was, uh, training up here in Whistler. Um, I'm staring up at black home mountain right now at the window and I was training right here on this mountain and, um, I had come back from the season and I was completely broke and trying to figure out a way to, to make some quick cash. So I got a job as a bartender in a little restaurant and um, kind of always been a bit entrepreneurial. You know, like when I was 10, I had a lawn mowing business. Um, uh, I dabbled with, you know, always trying to make money here and there, however I could. Um, did a ton of different jobs growing up, a ton of different jobs. And I always kind of had the the idea in my mind that the more I did, the better I would be when I grew up. Um, so I'm very grateful that for that, actually, because um, that helped me be, be a better entrepreneur for sure. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, I had the idea just to, to really, you know, when I was a bartender, I was like, I might as well just figure out how to be my own bartender here and build a little cart and make fresh squeezed lemonade and, uh, you know, make my own money. So in a way I was creating my own job at that time. Um, and the way I looked at it was, you know, it, it's kind of like being a bartender, you know, I, I made it so that it looked like a little bar and, um, you know, uh, I had a fresh squeezer and I, you know, made my own sugars. So I kind of just made it as cool as possible. So I was like using a shot glass and like, you know, putting two shots of sugar and then I would shake <laughs> it up. And so I really was just replicating like what I wanted to do that summer. And um, thank God I did. And, you know, I think something that I that com comes to me naturally is I'm willing to just, I have an idea and I'm willing to go for it. That hasn't always worked for me. That has actually been a bit of a problem for me um, through the years, right? But As with all entrepreneurs, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, but that's also what makes us, you know, good entrepreneurs is <clears throat> we're willing to try stuff. And as you know, I'm sure we fail at stuff. And that's how we start to get, you know, good at what we do. Yeah, very true. When, uh, what was the very first festival that, or carnival or event that you worked at or that you had a stand at? Yeah, so when I started, I got a, a spot in downtown Santa Fe in the, in the, the art district uh, called Canyon Road. Uh -huh. And um, I just had a cart in a spot, one spot, cart, and that was that. And uh, I was making about a hundred bucks a day, which was, you know, looking back on it was not a lot of money, but at the time that was, that was replicating my, what I was making as a bartender, about a hundred bucks a night, um, during my shift. So what happened was two weeks into it, one of, uh, my customers, this, this woman came up and said, wow, this is really great lemonade. Oh, I love uh, I, I love the look of what you're doing here. And, and would you, would you like to come to my festival? I'm in charge of, of hiring vendors. And I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that was called Spanish market in Santa Fe. Just, it's an art market and uh, very, still very popular. And I recruited my dad. Um, so it was me and my dad and we went out for the weekend and brought in 3000 bucks. Nice. So, so again, at the time I was like, wow, 
hundred bucks a day, three thousand dollars in a weekend. I'm done with the location. <laughs> I'm going all in on festivals. And literally, I just what you know, head down and just applied to every show that I could from that point forward for the next ten years, to be honest. I mean, just like going like a madman. Wow. And again, again, like not the best business plan. <laughs> Looking back <laughs> on it, like no direction, no, you know, no one, uh, no mentors coaching, no, no help, just head down, like figure it out as I go. And, um, that's why we got good at what we do now. And, or at the time, what, how I got good at what I did and how the business has grown into what it is today. Wow. So that first season, did you actually only work six months and then return to, to, to Whistler to go skiing? Yeah. So for the first 10, 12 years, it was four months. So our, my motto for, for many years was work four months, play for eight. Yeah. Uh, so we had, we, I always say we now, cause my company, I have a lot of employees, but I, <laughs> Um, back then, we, we I would start uh, the end of May, and I would go till the end of September. So it was a f- solid four months. I found that, you know, a little earlier than May, you know, you're kind of, it's a little sketchy with the rain, and after it gets cold. So that was kind of my window. Yeah. And to be honest, that's still our window. Um, it's just that we've added some really strong events like Coachella in, in California in April, and it's in the desert, so it's safe. Um, so, but still we, when you add up our days, we still only work four months of the year. Gotcha. And so how much did you make in that first year? The first year I brought in 28,000 bucks. And that was enough for you to, to snow or to ski for the next eight months. Yeah, absolutely. That my goal for that first year was to have, actually, I was invited to do another, to be on another, uh, uh, private kind of pro ish that was like kind of a loose word back then um snowboard team and they were going to be training in aspen and the 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 coaching cost was ten thousand bucks oh wow (laughs) so my goal was i needed to have the ten thousand bucks plus living expenses so i needed to have around 15 grand to be able to pull it off nice and i think that's you know i don't think that's how this works i know that this is how it works because we still do it today I set money goals from the very beginning, not consciously understanding what I was doing, actually. But back then, again, it was just so that I had the means to have my winter free so I didn't have to go get a job at, you know, wherever. Um, So my goal was the 10 or 15 that I needed, and I made 28. And in my business, you can make around a 50% profit. Um, So there's your there's the money I needed for the winter. Do you still consciously make money goals every year? Oh, absolutely. Not every year, every show. Every show. And what's that process like for you? Like, Take us through um, you analyzing a show or event that you're going to um, uh, work at and deciding, okay, this is how much I think I can make. Um, how, does that, how does that play out? Well, today, so <clears throat> we have our, you know, actually this year we did three new events but most of our events are, you know, repeats. We're 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 on um, the same tour, if you will. Um, but the great thing about what's going on with with my company is we're increasing our sales every year. So, so the process for for me and my team is um, my top guys, my 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 operations managers, and um, basically it's just between us. So we will set the goal of like I'll give you an example. <clears throat> a great example actually is a show that we did in um, in California this this summer in Napa Valley, and I was not going to be there this year. So that's another great part about growing is. Eventually, you can step out of it and let your team, as long as you have a strong team, run some of these shows. So what I did was, um, like we always do, is we set that goal. And um, the cool part about this example is I wasn't actually there. So the goal was the year previous, we had made $70,000 at that show. And this is over a few days. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and we wanted to increase our sales. So I said to my main manager, Hey, let's, let's shoot for a hundred. Let's increase, you know, $30,000. And he, um, <clears throat> is definitely been trained pretty intensely by me over, you know, <laughs> over the last years. And he's just one of those very adaptable, um, sponge minds who will just, you know, bring it, bring it on and, and, and actually not only like blindly go, but, um, understand what it is that we're trying to accomplish. And what I mean by that is he, he's not said it, we're not setting unrealistic goals. We're not saying we're going to bring in, you know, half a million dollars at the show because it's just, it's not possible. And I think that as a, a new entrepreneur or an entrepreneur or any, or anyone, you have to be realistic in what you are, what you're actually trying to accomplish. Yeah. So anyway, we had, we had set the goal for a hundred and he said, I really think we can do one ten. Let's set it at one ten. I thought, shit buddy <laughs> you know i love i love the ambition yeah and um this is what you know has made again this my company grow is the not only my ambition but my guys and my gals their ambition too so um so the event goes by he sends me the numbers and he hit one hundred and eleven thousand dollars. wow so we're always very very conscious of what we're what we're trying to do, but we kind of reverse engineer it and we say, okay, well, how many lemonades do we need to sell in order to get to that goal? If our price point is, <clears throat> you know, um, whatever it is, $8, uh, some of our show, a lot of our shows were getting an average of $8 a lemonade now, which is phenomenal. <laughs> That's unheard of. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah. Which actually it's worth saying when I started the business, I, my price point, my entire game, my entire game, which is crazy to think of, was $2 for a small lemonade and $3 for a large lemonade. Yeah. And that, that was my game. And that's how I brought in $28,000 in the first season, which to me, if I know, you know what I know now, which is impossible, but even if I had figured out how to market a little better, I get a little more money, I could have doubled that money in the first year. So it's like, this is the, the, the magic of business. Yeah, absolutely. I want to ask you before we get too far down the road of your story, in those early days, other than like acting like a bartender to serve lemonade, was there anything that you did um, that made you stand out from some of the, the other vendors that made you, that made that woman come up to you and say, or other people come up to you and say, I want you at my festival? Um, I, so growing up, I, I used to uh, build houses. So I was a laborer um, for years um, <clears throat> through my teenage years. So I had some skills with wood. So when I built that, and I still do this, we try to build our stuff the coolest of anyone. And I, I mean, not to pat myself on the back, which I am right now, but um, we really do try, not only try, but we accomplish looking better than everyone else. Uh, I think that this is an extremely important part of business, especially for my business. The traditional vendor, if you will, will go out and put up a pop-up tent and um, put up a banner and that's it. That's what they do. And we go in there and we build a cafe. Um, so, you know, right now we have a show that's happening, not happening. It's being built out right now. I fly in on Monday and the guys are already building it out, but we're building out three big really, really cool looking cafes. And we use a lot of wood and metal just cause that's kind of the stuff that I like. And we do as you know, we, we we're always like reinventing, not reinventing like on a, you know, yearly basis, but we're always like the better word is ahead of the curve. Yeah. We're always trying to be really, you know, as with, the times as possible and get ahead of, of everyone else. And we've done a great job with that. And because of that, we've gotten some unbelievable contracts um, and developed amazing business relationships with people who just love not only the way we look, but a system behind it. Like, you know, <clears throat> we are talking about lemonade here, but lemonade, when you do the numbers that we do, we're doing six figures in you know, in shows, our, our, our goal, our, not our goal, our, our, um, our, our record is over six figures in a day. Oh so, my gosh. 
So we're doing really, and in order to pull that kind of money in, you need to have a super solid system. Yeah. So we've got that. And um, so I'd say from the beginning, that's, you know, I, back then I, I built it out of wood. I went to the local lumber yard, found the coolest old, you know, naughty, cool wood. <laughs> and I was into uh, an island theme for some reason back then. And I, I made like a thatched roof, which didn't match at all being in New Mexico. <laughs> but it just worked, right? It just seemed like a, a holiday. And I think it's worth saying too that <clears throat> who you put behind the bar, mm -hmm. right, is enormously important. So it was me. I was a 22 year old, happy, excited kid. It was my business. I would, I've always been good with customers, right? I like, I like to talk to people. Um, so I think that made a huge difference too. How long did it take you guys or you in the early days to start getting some of the bigger events and bigger contracts? Um, well, another cool story is second year in, um, and, you know, I do tell this story probably too often, but it's just the story. So here we go. Um, second year in, we or I applied to the Woodstock 99 30th year reunion. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's so, a good one. <laughs> yeah. And it was a huge stretch, right? A huge stretch financially. It was $5,000 to get in. Um, but I thought, what, whatever, I'm going to apply. I'm going to see if I, you know, get into this thing. And um, I got in. Wow. So that was a very, very exciting time for me when I got the the email or the letter or whatever came back then in 1999. <laughs> um, I literally remember jumping up and down, just being like, holy shit, this is unbelievable. And I, this is going to be really great. So got into Woodstock 99, drove <clears throat> my 100% shitty truck across the country <laughs> from New Mexico to New York solo, uh -huh. completely solo with all of my, with my one lemonade stand, which had grown from a little cart into like a 10 foot stand. Uh -huh. And it was still very unique and cool wood, lots of kind of old wood and really, really kind of unique and, and, uh, 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 looking back on it, though, it's like, wow, man, it was it, it just functionality could have been better. Um, but this is how this is how we progress. Um, so, yeah, I got into Woodstock 99, recruited some of my college buddies to help because I went to school out in New Hampshire for a couple of years. Um, and we did it and brought in forty three thousand dollars. Wow. <laughs> So did it, did it click for you yeah. then? It's like, okay, these big events are the big money makers. Yeah, that, that, so these are the wins. Like this is the great part of like, <clears throat> you know, when people ask me how to, I don't know, how to become a better entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Like you need these, these confidence builders. Like these, if you see the staircase ahead of you or the mountain ahead of you, you need to have these confidence builders and <clears throat> you need to chase down like, you know, first of all, put yourself out there and set those goals like I've been talking about and then go out there and get that confidence builder. So for, for me, that was a huge confidence builder. I saw, holy crap, I can bring in a lot of money. And, and like, it's crazy to think that was in 1999. That was with one stand one stand mm -hmm. that's it now we go into shows and we have 10 at the very least wow most of our events we do 10 to as many as 20 locations so we have a lot of locations and that's another thing that we've figured out over the years is you know duplication within uh an event is definitely the way to go um because you can just maximize uh, a single area and a single a single event and put all your focus focus being a very important word um, into running a really great great system um, and making sure that it runs like a like a well-oiled machine so so anyway that um, that was my first huge huge uh, win back back in the day so um, what are some of the festivals that you guys work at these days some of the big ones 
We do Coachella, which is a huge one for us. Um, really an amazing show. Most people out there have heard of it. It's, it's like pretty famous these days. Um, on the tail end of that, we do a show called Stagecoach, which is connected to Coachella. It's just a it's a country festival. Um, we do Bottle Rock Music Festival. Uh, we do EDC Electric Daisy Carnival in uh, Las Vegas. We do Bonnaroo Music Festival in Tennessee. Um, we do uh, uh, um, a couple of events in New Mexico. We just do uh, one fair now. We do the New Mexico State Fair, and we do our last show of the year, which we're about to dive into now, is called the Albuquerque International Balloon Fiesta, and that's a hot air balloon festival. Yeah, I've heard of that. Really pretty famous show. It's uh, pretty pretty awesome, and we do our coffee there. So it's, you know, the weather changes. It's October. And um, we uh, we have three. We, we only have three spots there, but they're big spots, big, big, big spots, big cafes, really cool. And that's a neat show that brings in almost a million people over nine days. So Holy we – yeah, so we go to like you know most most businesses are operating off of people coming to them, right? And we go to the people. So I you know have always figured out well the best shows have the best potential and the most people, and um, so that's where we we put ourselves in the best possible um, events, and then we've over time been able to put ourselves in the best possible locations at those events. That's a good strategy. Uh, I'm curious, Josh, and I'm sure you have plenty of these stories, but if you can share one wild, crazy, funny story with us about, about running a festival somewhere. Oh, gosh. Yeah, there's been like so many. <laughs> I can imagine. Over the years. But, you know, I guess we've like, we've... You know, like not everything has been like, you know, awesome. Like, you know, and I'm pretty grateful for that because, you know, in the hard times and like the, the times where I'm like, you know, I'm I'm like, this is too much. I'm done. I, I got to find another business. Um, I'm glad that I stuck it out, uh, you know, because no matter what we do in life, it's a little tricky and things are a little hard. Even if you're working from your laptop, you know, you still have to find your clients uh, it's, it's not an easy model here on planet earth. So, so a story would be, um, a show that we've done for a long time is Bonnaroo. Bonnaroo Music Festival is in Tennessee. It's in like the rolling hills of Tennessee. And, uh, it's kind of the closest show to like Woodstock. It's kind of rooty. It's kind of, you know, dirty. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and we've had a lot of growing pains there um, and a lot of wins and a lot of a lot of everything. So we used to be uh, primarily out in the camping area. So a lot of these shows, you have a camping area and then you have the inside area. Yeah. And for, forever, we couldn't even get inside. Like it took years to get inside. And it, like uh, since we're talking about Bonnaroo. It's just, it's a really interesting actually in like the importance of patience and, <laughs> and vision. So Bonner is a great example. It took me 10 years to get, so we've been there 12 years. No, it took me eight years to get inside. So we're for the first freaking eight years, I'm outside in the camping area and the camping area is wild. You could imagine. <laughs> right. And like, especially this show, like Coachella is not so wild. It's pretty, pretty tame. I think compared to some of the stuff that we've done, but Bonnaroo, there's this one area called pod three pod three is, um, they call it the, what is it? Shakedown street, kind of like shakedown, like, well, I guess grateful dead uh -huh. era. I don't know. And basically shakedown street, is a drug fest <laughs> okay <laughs> like crazy stuff going on so there used to be like here we are running our lemonade stand and it's open 24 hours a day down there because people are just partying and it's just it's wild mm -hmm. um and one year in particular uh there were drug deals happening like like basically right near or next to our stand like you know the most obvious things it was very uncomfortable actually to be honest um 
And and our neighbors, this is kind of funny, but not really. <laughs> our neighbors, these pizza guys, they were all on coke. Oh, they God. were all <laughs> coked out and crazy. And they were like, so as the show progresses, it's a four day show. Things get crazier and crazier, and there's drug deals happening inside their their uh, their wow. their booth. Yeah, and um, the owner at one point is chasing his daughter down the street with a knife. Whoa! <laughs> no way. And at another time, a, one of their workers gets a bottle cracked over their head, and wow. I'm like thinking, I'm a pretty pretty like innocent guy, really pretty focused on business I'm, I'm not there for i'm really not there and i never have been there for and you know let me just add that i think this is one of the reasons why we've done so well i've always been there for business to make money yeah a lot of these guys are there to party and i'm like why are you combining partying and business <laughs> and like, That's funny like just focus on making your pizza man uh-huh. and you do so much better so um so that was a crazy that was a crazy year. And, you know, to be honest, that show, it was like that for many, many years. And I remember very, very specifically going to the uh, the organizer and saying, look, like, I am done with Wild West. I called it Wild West. Like, I, I, I really, we need to be inside. We've been here a long time and we really, you know, we're, we're going to leave your show if we can't get inside and get established inside where it's a normal business, I'm done with the wild west stuff. <laughs> and we did eventually, you know, um, get out of the wild west. It's been like two or three years now. And now we're inside. And the great thing about, about patience and vision and business relationships is we now have all the lemonade inside. Wow. So 17 locations inside Bonner. It wow. took us, it took us 12 years, um, but or 11 years or something, and now we we have the entire show inside, and we're as long as that show is around, as long as we don't screw up, and as long as we still want it, we'll have it forever. That's incredible, man. And certainly, like that's kind of I'm sure that's against the show rules to have, you know, your workers or people that are serving to be using drugs and to be uh, yeah. drug dealing and. Being violent yeah. and partying. That seems a little crazy. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I want to ask, you, you keep, this keeps coming up, and this is a, a huge part of my motto And talking to all these entrepreneurs. I find this comes up over and over and over again. You keep talking about the system, the system, the system, the system mm-hmm. of your business. What are some suggestions that you could give other fellow entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs that are listening about the importance of building a solid system? Gosh, you know, it's going to be different for obviously the thousand of different listeners uh, with their different business plans. Um, but I think um, I think simplicity like, you know, <clears throat> for for my stuff, um, you know, lemonade is is extremely simple, simple product. However, we've complicated the shit out of it. Right. <laughs> so, you know, so um So, gosh, it's kind of a tricky thing to answer because I think that the best the best answer that I could probably give would be the reason why, like, my system is what it is today is because I tried something and then I tweaked it and then I tried something and then I tweaked it and I tried something and I tweaked it. So it's kind of like the triple L, the, the triple T's rather. So you try it, you tweak it and you try again. And then you try it, you tweak it, and you try again. And I think, you know, I have dabbled with, not dabbled, I, I do have an online business program as well, which, to be honest, I find freaking way harder than this. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get the people to come to you, and I'm not used to that. I'm used to going to the people. Um, but, you know, I don't, you know it's, it's tricky because there are so many tools out there, and there's so much, like, shiny, cool shit out there that you want to, give a go. Yeah. I think that if you can simplify and you can have three good things that will make, you know, that work, then stick to that and stop looking around and focus, focus on those three tools or those two or those five or whatever it is, the things that you need to make your 
product sell and then focus and then do that over again and then within that tweak that so there's always going to be like variation and like some you know a product might not really go the way you wanted it to or you might have a new idea for a new way to sell that product tweak it not you know little tweaks until it works and then go with that um, until you want to you know create a new product that's what that that's what I've done you know, we've we've gone from, like I said before, selling a two dollar and a three dollar lemonade. We had two different flavors, lemonade and raspberry lemonade. And you know, it's 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 interesting, like that you can use lemonade as kind of a metaphor for business, but it's kind of in so many ways, lemonade is the perfect example of running a business. Um, if you can look at <laughs> if you can look at Whatever your stuff is as a lemonade, how can I sell this lemonade to a lot of people, right? That That's basically what we do. Like, how can we sell this very simple product, lemonade? Well, so how do you do it? Well, number one, make really good lemonade, right? Mm-hmm. So, Because there's a lot of guys out there that make really shitty lemonade. Like, why, why would you be a lemonade person and make shitty lemonade it makes no sense make the best lemonade that you can so whatever your product is make it the best product that you can and then figure out how to market it right so we figured out how to turn a two dollar lemonade into you know our our small shows or or rather not our small shows um our most of our shows we do uh we do one size now it's eight bucks and we add another dollar for a strawberry lemonade because we figured out that raspberry doesn't sell as good as strawberry so that was a tweak you know i used to have a menu that was ridiculous mango and blueberry and all this crazy stuff and i found that my line slowed down so i've always paid attention to how do i expand how do i try to make my products you know how do i tweak this simple idea into something bigger and then I've learned how to like go and back back off and like find what product really works the best. Um, Very hopefully cool. That- yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Actually, that's that's really world class advice. I was taking some notes while you were saying that because that was really good. Now, your company, Josh, uh, the philosophy is to live life to the fullest, you know. And I think you're doing this for your team and for yourself and and serving amazing lemonade and coffee to the world. Um, what does that mean living life to the fullest when you first started out and what does it mean for you now? Yeah. So for me, um, in the beginning it meant to have my winters free so that I didn't have to work. That's, that's what it meant. That was the goal for, for the first, you know, whatever I was still competing in the beginning. So I was, I was my own sponsor pretty much. Um, so that was the goal. And then when I stopped competing, I still wanted my winters free. I was, you know, still highly addicted and in love and passionate about skiing and being in the mountains and, and traveling and stuff. So for me, it was always to work those four months and have enough money to live the hell out of my life. So you know, travel for three months, not, you know, like I hate the traditional lifestyle. I just still makes me like kind of, I don't know, you know, not super excited for (laughs) a lot of. Fair to say it's okay. (laughs) Yeah. But so I'm, you know, I'm super untraditional, always have been. But so for me, you know, it was like, I want to travel for three months or a month or, you know, go on, amazing trips like this year I'm going to Alaska to go heli skiing and um nice. last year I went heli skiing in uh British Columbia and I go on you know month long trips in my my souped out truck RV that I can go you know four four by four by fouring in the in the snow and go skiing in the backcountry or whatever but at the point is is I can disappear for a month or three months or five months I can do that um I don't have to be back on Monday. And I think that it's like, you know, like I'm really grateful that we're all different, us humans. Like there's a place for those people who want to go to their nine to fives. There's a place for them. Like, thank God for them. Right. Because we can be who we are. Um, So, but for those of us who have that, like that fire inside 
who want to explore around and, um, you know, be adventurous, explore the world and experience cultures and all like you, right? Obviously, that's exactly who you are. Yeah. Then, then we have to make that shit happen. So um, I think I got, I think I got off a little off uh, the question there, but. Um, no, I think that's good, man. That's a great way to answer it for sure. A couple more questions, Josh, and we'll wrap up. If, if you knew you had an extra 100 years of life, what would you be doing differently? <laughs> huh. Um, I always got a little bit uh, annoyed with myself that I wasn't planning better. So this is kind of a double-edged sword for me because I'm I'm very I've been very in the moment for a lot of my life, and um, that is not a bad thing. Like I've done, I I, I go for stuff. I, if something comes to my way, if I have an idea, I go for stuff. And, you know, I apply to those big shows or or I hire massive teams. That's ridiculous. Still today, um, um. So I've been a little annoyed that I didn't plan better. Like you know, like get those those more locations or, or, you know, I guess been more minded. I, I'm trying to think of the best way to answer this here. Here it is right here. If I had thought about, you know, um, how to get better locations and more locations, um, and put more work in my off season, like <laughs> the, the double-edged sword here is the freedom is important. And I just told you that I can disappear for five months. However, it's really important to, to have that vision and to plan that vision. So if you're traveling around or if, if back then when I was traveling around, instead of just shutting my business down and putting it away and saying, I don't want to see you for six months, mm -hmm. see you in six months. If I had just spent a little time planted a little more seeds, then I think that I would be further along than I am now. So if I had more time, I guess, um, uh, you know, now that I hope I'm answering this, <laughs> um, I guess, you know, if I had more time, then I don't know what I'm complaining about because I could, that's uh, what I'm doing now. Yeah. So we're good. <laughs> <laughs> You're solid. You're planning everything now. <laughs> but I think that's important for the listeners, like plant those seeds. Yeah. Don't, you know, don't be too in the moment, plant the seeds because those seeds, man, they will grow. They will grow so huge that into a massive a beautiful tree if you plant those seeds and you think about about that future of yours great way to put it okay for you in the lemonade events business and i always ask the guests this what do you think is the difference between a five-figure mentality a six-figure mentality and a seven-figure mentality uh confidence <laughs> good answer could you elaborate a little bit more yeah, I really believe that confidence is what makes someone successful. So, so how does that work? Like, like I was saying before, if you don't have those little wins, those little wins that turn into bigger wins, if you don't climb that staircase and you're, you know, you, you just, you, as humans are, our emotions, as soon as we can feel like something worked, we're like, yes, awesome. It worked. Okay. I believe in myself. And so, and now you strive for something else. And so, okay, that, that next level. Yes. Okay. It worked. I believe in myself, right? If you don't believe in yourself, if you have that self doubt, or if you listen to the chatter of the world, which is going to be a dead end for you. <laughs> Don't listen to the chatter of the world. Um, you're going to have a lot of struggle. So I think that we as entrepreneurs, as people in general, we need to have those small little wins and build that confidence. So I think, I think the confidence is, is the way that a five figure can turn into a six and can turn into a seven. Um, and I think that planting the seeds you know, you have to plant the seeds. You got to look ahead and you got to be, you got to be setting goals. And 
I think it goes with the confidence because when you set the goals, like if I said, <clears throat> I want to make um, $100,000 this weekend and I had the means to do it and I had the product to do it and I had the system to do it and then I reached 99000 I would say, holy shit, I pulled it off. And I would have that self-worth, that self-confidence that I did this, I could do it. And then that your team would see that you could do it and that you're not full of shit. And then they start to believe in themselves that they can also do it. And now you're unstoppable. Very cool. Okay, last one. Can you give us any tips on how to make the best lemonade in the world? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, <clears throat> yeah, sure. Like lemonade is the is the it's like the easiest thing to make. And, you know, people are like, what's your secret recipe? And it's like, man, our, our, re our secret recipe is, is like, ready? <laughs> you ready? You're going to write it yeah, down? Yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> so water, <laughs> lemons, like actual lemons, you know, you're going to actually fresh squeeze those lemons. So however, you know, whoever's listening, you're going to go get some lemons <laughs> and uh, you're going to squeeze those lemons. You're going to get the juice out. And you're going to add sugar. And the best way to make a really phenomenal uh, lemonade is to not add sugar so that it's in sugar form. You actually want to make it into a syrup. So if you can boil, uh, make a simple syrup, so just do a 50% do a water and 50% uh, sugar, which is pretty thick. Mm -hmm. And then just sweeten it to your liking and fresh squeeze those lemons. The best lemon, the the here, here it is down to the tea. So get one and a half lemons. So three halves of a lemon, mm -hmm. cut them up, squeeze them. Um, this is for like a, around a 24 ounce size uh, lemonade. Squeeze those three halves and add, um, add the sugar to your liking, which is going to be like a shot of sugar if you use a shot glass and um, uh, some ice and some, you know, purified water to make it the best and then shake it up. Shake it up like you were at the bar and you're watching it. Your, your favorite bartender make you like that perfect uh, margarita. And they're, they're shaking that thing. They're not just like, you know, wussy shaking it. They are shaking it like like they own that thing. So shake it up and then, yeah, pour it over ice and there you go. That's the best fresh squeezed lemonade you'll ever have. That's the magic. That's the recipe. I'm going to try that out. Um, Josh, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and thank you for sharing all your tips and tricks and all your wisdom and especially that lemonade recipe. Uh, if the listeners want to reach out and learn more about what you have going on or if there's anything else you want to share with the listeners, where's the best place they can do that at? Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, they can check out my, my lemonade uh, website, which is just squeezedjuice.com. And on there, there's a lot of uh, uh, links to cool things. There, we even have a program called Squeeze Diversity, where where anyone out there looking for a business idea, we can we would help you build a business. Um, that's pretty neat. Or if you want to join our crew, even so, uh, we do some really neat events. And um, <clears throat> you can also find us on Instagram at just dot squeezed. And you can even check me out. Um, I'm at Instagram at Josh dot Lang, and my last name is spelled L A N G E. Very cool. And we didn't get too much into the squeeze diversity, but it looks like a really cool program to help entrepreneurs. Is it any type of entrepreneurs or just entrepreneurs that are that are building um, a business under events? Yeah, it's really anyone and, you know, anybody who you, we even have helped people who are getting out of their jobs, their J-O-Bs. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, youngsters to a little bit older, but I'd say the, the, the most ideal candidate for squeeze diversity is a young person that's got some real motivation to do something in life and who is driven by having some time off, right? Kind of like my style of, of living in this world. So, um, but we, you know, we can help people with their, their, their idea, but we do focus on, you know, what we do, which is the festival world and, and, uh, and doing any kind of product at a festival.
Very cool. And I noticed a cool documentary that you guys have on the website too. So something to check out, listeners. Josh, again, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and thanks for sharing everything. I really enjoyed our chat. And listeners, thank you guys for joining us once again. And we'll see you all on the next episode. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Take care. Hey, listeners, thanks for joining us once again. We wanted to remind you about our high-performance productivity coaching and our annual Get Shit Done live retreat in Thailand. Both are designed for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs to get a lot of work done rapidly. And whether you need some personal coaching while working away at home or a retreat in Thailand where you can get out of your normal routine and surround yourself with other successful entrepreneurs, we have those options for you. Check out all the details at thebusinessmethod.com and we'll see you on the next podcast.